Good morning. And our first item of business today is general questions. We start with question number one from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the timescale is for a feasibility study into developing carbon capture and storage at St Fergus. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the ACORN CCS project will be officially launched in Aberdeen on 26th of September 2017. The launch will signal the formal start of the feasibility stage of the project, which is anticipated to last 18 months. The ACORN project is managed by Pale Blue Dot, an energy transition consultancy based in Bankery, Aberdeenshire. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, may I welcome the commitment of the Scottish Government to the St Fergus project. Does the Minister share my disappointment to the UK Government's anti-carbon capture and storage inaction at St Fergus and the proactively hostile actions regarding it at Peterhead? Does that put at risk an opportunity that will not only benefit the environment but create jobs and boost the economy right across Scotland? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I certainly agree with uh, Stuart Stevenson's assessment that the UK Government's decision to scrap the previous uh, £1 billion carbon capture and storage programme, which of course included a, a strong commitment at that point to Peter Head, has, uh, has been a disgrace and a lost opportunity for Scotland and indeed the UK. Had this competition been allowed to run its course, the world's first commercial scale uh, gas powered CCS plant could have been built in Peterhead and the world's attention would have been drawn to the UK and Scotland as a trailblazer in this technology. Unfortunately, this first mover advantage has been uh, to some extent lost and would undoubtedly it would have attracted significant investment to the UK and brought with it further opportunities for job creation, skills development and position the UK with the potential to take its place as a supply chain for Europe in this important technology. It's worth stressing, presiding officer, that the need for CCS remains and in the fact the International Panel on Climate Change say that it would cost 138% more to achieve a two degrees Celsius climate change mitigation scenario without carbon capture and storage. And despite the clear need for CCS, uh, all UK government efforts to date to bring forward this technology have failed. Uh, given this track record of failure, uh, and in the rest of the UK, it is certainly a failure as well. Now, now essential that the UK government set out a clear and robust policy framework hopefully working with the Scottish Government and others who want to support the technology uh, in, and set that out in their soon-to-be-published uh, UK Clean Growth Plan. Question number two, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I remind the Chamber of my Register of Interest. And to ask the Scottish Government what policies it is implementing to support the development and progression of the farming industry. Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. Uh, President also, the Scottish Government currently implements the Common Agricultural Policy in Scotland using the flexibilities available in the EU regulations to deliver a CAP that best supports Scotland's farmers and crofters. Since being re-elected, this Government has developed and progressed a range of policies to help support Scotland's farming industry, including paying around £65.5 million per annum in Elfast, less favoured area uh, payments and committing £99 million to 1,417 businesses uh, under the Agri, Environment and Climate Change Scheme since the scheme opened, and also introducing initiatives such as the Women in Agriculture Task Force. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Yeah, I, you know, I, I welcome uh, the ambition 2030 to grow our food and drink industry and double it by 2030. But, and uh, what this could mean for our fantastic food and drink industry. However, this strategy does not mention a single policy providing support for profitability and sustainability of our farmers. Can I ask the government what they are doing to rebalance the food chain to ensure the producer gets a fairer share of the consumer spend for the high quality produce that they produce? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scotland's food and drink sector promotes uh, and wishes to see more, even more success in the sales of fine uh, Scottish farm produce uh, and works very closely uh, with the Scottish Government and we work very closely with the sector. Just yesterday I, I met uh, the NFUS president once again. Uh, so I, I think it's a bit churlish not to recognise the good work that Scotland Food and Drink do, quite frankly. Uh, but of course, as I said in the debate last week, we want to see farmers receive more credit for the excellent work they do. They produce fine quality food. They are the custodians of our landscape. However, I have to say, and I will be putting this point to Mr Gove, presiding officer, when I meet him on Monday, 
the lack of clarity about payment, continued payment after 2019 to Scotland's hill farmers, uh, over 12,000 of them, could, as I explained to Mr Gove when I had a meeting with him at the Royal Highland Show in June, lead to thousands, thousands of hill farmers being forced out of business. That would be a catastrophe for Scotland. And I hope, and at long last, the UK government can start to do its day job on this matter and give some absolutely clear-cut assurances that hill farmers, in particular in Scotland, have been waiting for for far too long. Neil Ross. Thank you, President Officer. The Chamber will be aware that convergence funding was earned in Scotland due to our average per hectare rate, which brought the UK-wide average below the 90% qualifying threshold. Can the Scottish Government confirm if it has received any guarantee from the UK Government that it plans to pass on the EU convergent uplift funding to Scotland? Minister, Cabinet Secretary. It, this is a very serious issue. The UK received £190 million uh, because, and only because, uh, Scotland's farmers receive 45% of the EU average per hectare. That money was intended for Scotland and only for Scotland's farmers who received far, far less than any other farmers in the UK per hectare. Successive UK government ministers have promised a review of this presiding officer and every single one of them has broken that pledge. When I raised this with Andrea Leadsom last October, she promised she would reply quickly. No reply has been received. Again, as you may expect, I will be raising this on Monday with Mr. Gove. That money is due to Scotland's farmers, Scotland's hill farmers. It's worth around £14,000, £14,000 to each hill farmer in Scotland. That money was taken by the UK government. It's Scotland's money, and we want it back. Question number three, Miles Briggs. The Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve access at Waverley Station for disabled, blind and visually impaired people. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government continues to encourage Network Rail, who manage Waverley Station and ScotRail, to work closely with the station stakeholder group that has been set up to build on the access improvements achieved over the recent years. I know from my meeting with the station group in March that more can be done, and that is why I recently asked Network Rail to convene a further meeting of the station group to explain recent developments and a wide range of ongoing issues that have particular impact on disabled passengers. As Mr Briggs is aware, the group met on the 7th of September and those involved will continue to work through the detail of uh, any unresolved matters. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for that answer, but is the Minister aware of the level of anger and frustration among blind and disabled rail users and members of the City's Access Panel that Network Rail's planned taxi rank for New Street Car Park will now not take place? Given the importance the Minister gave to the Accessible Travel Framework, which he launched last year, will he agree to intervene and demand that these plans to improve access for disabled and visually impaired people are developed? And will he reconsider his decision to refuse to meet with me and the, access, uh, the City Access Panel, who have identified urgent action points which would improve access at the station right now for vulnerable travellers. Minister. Can I uh, recognise Miles Briggs and many MSPs, I think Ash Denham uh, also involved in this issue, one of paramount importance. Can I just put some context which uh, he left out uh, in his answer? He will know, of course, as I said, that Network Rail, a uh, reclassified body under the Department for Transport, is responsible for managing Waverley Station. But the reason why the new street car park proposal uh, is not going ahead as planned in 2017 is because of significant remedial work that City of Edinburgh Council now say is required to North Bridge. They say that access to North Bridge will come in through uh, New Street. Now, I am disappointed, just as uh, he is. I can understand the anger. I can understand the frustration. But he will agree with me, I'm sure, that the safety of passengers is paramount. So if there is remedial work needed to be done at the North Bridge via the New Street uh, uh, access, uh, then he will agree that that uh, priority uh, is, of course, important. But that is not to say, uh, of course, that the... Uh, issues, the concerns that the stakeholder group have, that the member has, uh, they are equally uh, as important. So, of course, I'm more than happy. I would take some issue with him to say that I refuse to meet. I simply suggested that he should meet with Network Rail 
uh, and indeed because they of course manage uh, the station and Edinburgh City Council to understand a little bit more if he wishes to meet with me of course I'm more than happy uh, to meet uh, with him and to discuss this issue uh, further. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Minister aware, as I am, through my constituency mailbox, that there are difficulties for disabled passengers in the Borders Railway, which terminates in one direction at Waverley, but that's also in part due to the aged 158 rolling stock? And can he advise me when that rolling stock will be coming down the line in, in, in providing better carriages? Minister. Again, can I recognise uh, the member's interest uh, in this, and she has been in, in contact with me previously. Uh, what I would say is 26 of the fleet of 40 uh, of the 158s, which are the most operated on the Borders route, uh, have already been upgraded to meet the requirement for the persons with reduced mobility, including fitting two dedicated wheelchair spaces, companion seating, call for aid buttons, enhanced universal access, accessible toilets, improved customer information screens, uh, and priority uh, seating the entire ScotRail fleet will meet the re rail vehicle access standards before the 1st of January 2020, as required by legislation. Uh, Class 170s used on borders have been compliant since their introduction uh, to Scotland uh, in 1990. Uh, in terms of the plans to cascade, yes, I can uh, uh, assure the member uh, that uh, plans uh, are still uh, in place, of course, to cascade uh, uh, carriages across the network to ensure that uh, we continue to provide uh, the most up-to-date and the best rolling stock that we possibly can to the borders uh, and indeed across the network uh, to Scotland. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The changes to Waverley Station have been in place for some time now, and with the changes to the taxi rank, making uh, access for those with mobility issues significantly uh, 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 impacted. And I note in his answer to Miles Briggs, he stopped short of saying that he would meet with the Edinburgh Access Panel. Can you now take the opportunity to agree to not just meet with the member over there, but to meet with the access panel? In short, will the minister make himself accessible to talk about accessibility? Minister. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful soundbite, but uh, what, I did, what, I did say, what I did say is that I've already met with the accessibility panel. I'm the one that uh, helped to facilitate and convene the meeting that he didn't attend. I should say uh, Ash Denham and Miles Briggs uh, did uh, attend. Now, I would be more than happy for the avoidance of any doubt to meet Miles Briggs, to meet the accessibility panel. Of course, I would be. Uh, my point is just a, a one of, of fact and context here that the station is, of course, managed by Network Rail. Uh, they are the ones uh, alongside Edinburgh City Council uh, who completely, of course, have the responsibility for the remedial works that are going on in the station. Uh, now, I don't have a ministerial magic wand, but of course I will meet with uh, the access panel. I will, will meet with members, but please do realise the importance that safety must be the priority for passengers, whether they have accessibility issues or not. Question number four, John Mason. A thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what estimate it has made of the proportion of retailers adhering to single-use carrier bag legislation. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. As enforcement is a matter for local authorities, the Scottish Government does not hold information on it. However, local authorities will hold information on enforcement activity undertaken in their own areas. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that reply. Last week I bought an article of clothing, a jersey in Royal Mile, and was not charged for the bag. And this has happened to me several times in my own constituency when I'm shopping. Yeah, I just wonder if the Minister has any concern that uh, there is uh, a bit of not adherence to this legislation. Minister. Well, I, I wish Mr Mason luck with his new jersey. I hope it's an attractive <laughs> one. I have, uh, <laughs> Enfor enforcement is, of course, as I mentioned in my original answer, <laughs> A matter for local authorities, not just in fashion, perhaps, but, um, <laughs> but generally through uh, trading standards. And it's carried out on an intelligence-led basis. Uh, so on a serious point, if the member, uh, or indeed members of the public, have uh, concerns about particular retailers, he may wish to, uh, to raise that with Glasgow City Council, and specifically the trading standards team within Glasgow City Council. Uh, all evidence we've seen, though, uh, such as uh, Marine Conservation Society's Beach Clean, suggests the charges are having the desired effect of cutting the overall number of uh, bags being dispensed and we are seeing a greatly improved environment on our beaches. Morris Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister provide an estimate of the potential impact a charge on disposable coffee cups might have on the Scottish Government's target of a 15% reduction in waste by 2025? Minister. 
Um, I, I certainly recognise the issue that Morris Golden has raised. It's uh, certainly uh, an issue in terms of the uh, use of single-use cups is something that we are aware of has been raised as a concern <coughs> and uh, the Scottish Government is uh, looking to uh, undertake work to understand the, the potential impact of that, such a measure. So uh, we're constituting an expert panel to look into what a range of measures along similar lines to the carrier bag charge uh, can be taken. And this work will be kicked off by consideration of a charge in single-use cups such as coffee cups. Uh, which are often litters, I'm sure the member knows, and are very difficult to dispose of and recycle indeed. So therefore we'll seek to encourage people to reuse, uh, to use re reusable alternatives. Uh, but I will raise the point with the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform that, uh, and see if there's some further information we provide on the potential impact of it. And question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it is given to implementing a European-style ticketing model for rail travel. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, I understand this question has its origins in the area of penalty fares, which at present are not operated in Scotland. ScotRail is undertaking a number of in initiatives to reduce ticketless travel, including an advertising campaign around buy before you board and encouraging passengers on the benefits of switching to smart. Stuart, Stuart McMillan. Thank the Minister for that reply, but does the Minister believe that, uh, that the European ticketing system would actually aid a belly with Scotland with revenue collection and also to assist with some of the antisocial behaviour that has occurred you know, due to the many unstaffed stations on the network? And would he ask a belly with Scotland to examine the feasibility of the introduction of such a model? Minister. As I say, there aren't plans at the moment to introduce ticket, uh, penalties for ticketless travel. Uh, if that approach is made by a belly with Scotland, really, it would involve a, a contract variation. Of course, we could look at the feasibility uh, of that. In terms of uh, antisocial behaviour, I'm working with a number of MSPs uh, across the political parties and their own stations, whether it's Hamilton Central or, or, or Helensburgh Station. And some of the actions that have been taken, uh, we're hopefully seeing a reduction uh, in some of that antisocial behaviour. If he thinks there's a particular problem at a station in his constituency, I'm more than happy to meet with the member and see how we can help to reduce that. Question number six, Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase social housing in Edinburgh. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, on this Scottish Housing Day, can I say to Mr McPherson that over this parliamentary period, the Scottish Government has allocated affordable housing supply programme funding of nearly £190 million to the City of Edinburgh, which we expect to deliver around 4,000 homes. This will be for Housing Association uh, and the City Council-led 21st Century Homes programme to deliver a range of housing in a mix of affordable tenures, but primarily focusing on social rented housing, which of course is a key government priority. Ben McPherson. I thank the Minister for that answer and warmly welcome the, the action that the Scottish Government has already taken. Does the Minister agree with me that as Edinburgh's population expands, as it is predicted to do in the coming years, the city will require a greater share of Housing Association grant subsidy levels in order to provide an adequate supply of social housing here in our growing capital city? Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, President Officer, I'm pleased that Edinburgh Council is developing a long-term ambitious new build uh, affordable homes programme uh, for the next decade. Uh, and by at the end of the parliamentary period, as, as, uh, Edinburgh will be receiving around £16 million pounds more than their allocation this year. That's a 55% increase in its resources to meet the housing needs uh, of the city, including social housing. I was very pleased this morning uh, to be able to go to see a development uh, that Dunedin and Canmore are bringing forward at Craig Miller, a project built by CCG, uh, which uh, will add an, another 111 homes here in Edinburgh. And I hope with the Affordable Homes Programme, with open market shared equity and a number of other government schemes, including the National Housing Trust, that we will continue to see growth in housing here in Edinburgh. Question number seven, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the importance of rural schools. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises that rural schools play a hugely important part in ensuring a vibrant and sustainable local community and economy in towns and villages across rural Scotland. That is why this Government made amendments to the Schools Consultation Scotland Act 2010 in 2014 to make the consultation process for school closure proposals more transparent and rigorous and to strengthen the requirements related to rural schools. John McAlpine. 
Thank you. In Dumfries and Galloway, the Council have put forward proposals to close A, Kirkbean and Garleston primary schools. In each case, the proposals for closure have been met with fierce resistance from parents and the local community who see huge educational benefits for their children in being a small classroom setting, as well as community benefits from the use of the schools for other activities. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Council must listen to these communities, take into account the devastation that would be felt should these close schools close, uh, both to the education of the children and the sustainability of these villages. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr. Officer, uh, the local authority is obliged to follow the uh, terms of the Schools Consultation Scotland Act 2010, which requires it to undertake a statutory consultation in line with that Act, uh, should the Council decide to pursue that approach. Uh, this approach includes, among other things, complying with the special arrangements that apply to rural schools and ensuring that parents and all those affected by the proposal have an opportunity to make their views known. Um, consequently, I would expect the local authority to meet its obligations in terms of that act. Given the statutory role that uh, I have in the process, uh, I'm sure Joe McAlpin and members will appreciate that I'm unable to comment further on specific aspects of any proposals in the case that this prejudices or is seen to prejudice any subsequent decision that I may have to take in terms of that act. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. And before we uh, turn to First Minister's questions, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery Her Excellency Tamar Berushashvili, the Ambassador of Georgia to the UK.